choreographic associate for the National Ballet of Canada, Robert Benet. What you just saw was a duet from my ballet, Orpheus Becomes Eurydice. The Greek myth of Orpheus and Eurydice tells a story of attempted rescue. Orpheus, a man, attempts to rescue his girlfriend Eurydice from the underworld. The core of this myth remains fascinating and heartbreaking. Why is it so often impossible to rescue the ones that we love? Now, the challenge of creating ballet is always to understand how to tell story through movement. Dancers execute extreme movements in order to express extreme emotions. The myth of Orpheus poses a problem, though, because in classical ballet partnering technique, the man almost always partners from behind the woman. You know, he turns her, he lifts her. And lifting someone is incredibly difficult if you're not allowed to look at them. So I thought, wouldn't it make more sense if the woman were the one leading without looking back? If the woman were the Orpheus character? which would mean that the woman becomes the more powerful character. Now, this is important because ballet is perhaps the most gendered of all art forms. Men and women are trained very differently in order to emerge into the profession with different skill sets. This all stems from the fact that ballet is a purely physical art form. You know, your body is your instrument. And cis male and cis female bodies largely are capable of different things. Ballet training emphasizes this and the repertoire does demand it. It would be nearly impossible to find someone who has both the strength needed to lift another person over their head while also possessing the weightlessness and purity of line needed to portray a swan. Sadly, because of how gendered ballet technique is, the relationships we see on stage are almost entirely heterosexual and the women are so rarely empowered within these relationships. Now, it's very clear that in today's society, gender roles are being constantly blurred and redefined. In the stories of the classical ballets, the women are generally either rescued or destroyed by the men, and the men tend to be insensitive, dim-witted, or both, quite frankly. These stories are beautiful stories and are so often reflective of the times these ballets were created in. But because the fundamentals of ballet technique were also created in these times, you know, in the courts of Louis XIV, in Tsarist Russia, the technique itself constantly steers us back towards these sorts of rigid gender roles and power imbalances between men and women. So telling new stories that are relevant and accessible to modern audiences through the classical ballet technique is a challenge. So that brings me back to our story. In the duet you just saw, we spent a lot of time in the creation process trying to understand how to still use these balletic conventions, how to still use the support of the man that allows the woman to do what she does on the tips of her toes while still having her look like the leader, having her look like the rescuer, and how to still use the amazing overhead lifts that make ballet so special and so literally heightened while still allowing the male character to look weak or vulnerable. Where we just left off is when the woman has discovered that her brother has taken his own life and cannot be rescued very simply because he doesn't want to be rescued. What you'll see next in a moment is the transfer of grief. Now that she has seen her brother's pain, she carries it with her. She wears it, and this drives her into her own version of the underworld. Here, her lover, her rescuer, comes to see her, at first unaware of what has happened with her brother. In this next duet, we do revert to the traditional genders of Orpheus and Eurydice, but it is a story in which the woman is never in any way passive. The man is responding to her impulses. In the end, this man is not strong enough to carry his lover's pain the way she carries the pain of her brother. This creates great disappointment in himself and drives him into his own personal underworld. Here, you will see a stranger finds him and sees that he is overcome by pain and guilt.
version of Orpheus ends with a modern solution for escaping this figurative underworld, truly seeing, listening, and communicating. When we were creating this ballet, we wanted to create an example in our art that we could attempt to follow in our lives. An example of how to wholeheartedly accept another person without even desiring to change them. And an example of how truly listening and sharing can release so much of the tension and strife from our lives and relationships. This is how I believe ballet can be part of conversations larger than the art world. By setting an example. You know, ballet cannot deal in specifics. We can't comment on what's going on in the news for so many artistic and practical reasons. But ballet can communicate emotions with a potency and clarity that few forms of expression can. And ballet can go far deeper than words into how humans relate to one another. And human relations are at the core of all social issues. If we can channel this correctly, ballet could be a powerful agent of social change. That is our challenge. And I don't claim that this work we're presenting here today has tackled all these issues I've spoken about. This will all take time. Ballet, like all art forms, is a system of expression that has been developed by human beings over hundreds of years. If we are able to adapt our oldest art forms to be able to accept and express modern gender roles and diverse sexual identities, then I challenge our political leaders to do the same in our laws. I challenge our business leaders to do the same in the workplace, and I challenge our spiritual leaders to do the same in their communities. And to my fellow artists, let's do this. Our art can lead by example. Thank you. <laughs>